पंद्रह सौ का Dr. Kiran Bedi with flowers. Our Honorable Vice Chancellor, who has always been so encouraging and so motivating in all our endeavors is also here this evening and we'd like to welcome him as well with a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> Professor Shri Krishna Devarao, our discussant this evening, will also be welcomed with a bouquet. Before we begin, I think it's time to start the silent revolution. Would everybody please switch off their mobile phones? It's a reminder, and if you think you already have done it before entering the hall, I would request you to please, please check your mobile phones once again, because that is not the kind of music we would like to hear in the middle of the lecture. Please. I'd also like to request Gitanjali to be on stage and interpret this evening's proceedings to the students who have just joined the newly launched BA for Applied Sign Language in IGNO. So Gitanjali is on the stage and she'll be interpreting this evening's proceedings. May I now request Dr. Lata Pillai, our Pro Vice Chancellor and the coordinator of the Silver Jubilee Lecture Series to say a few words of welcome and to introduce our guest. On behalf of Indira Gandhi National Open University and my personal behalf, I'd like to warmly welcome Dr. Kiran Bedi, the speaker for this evening. I think the weather in Delhi has really changed. It's warm as, uh, should I say, within a very short span of the end of winter. I did not Google Kiran Bedi to see what her profile was, nor how, do, how does one introduce her as a speaker, because I thought, you know, it was like looking for the obvious. Dr. Kiran Bedi has always been a role model to many young women. She's been known in Delhi for her work on traffic control as Crane Bedi. She's been known for her policy of equal treatment I have looked at her from a distance, admired her for the work that she's done in Mizoram and the BPRD in Goa. She's been known for the, um, shall I say, tremendous reforms that she's brought out in the Tihar jail. I won't expand on it further because I guess the Vice Chancellor will do that. In short, she's been known for one simple thing. Actions speak louder than words. And ma'am, that's something which is really appealing and makes a difference to people like us. It's your passion, your commitment that has been, uh, shall I say, a sterling quality rarely found. 
This series that we have of Silver Jubilee Lectures commenced in, no in November the, to commemorate the 25th year of Indira Gandhi National Open University. The celebrations or the activities were initiated by the visitor of India, by the visitor of the university, the president of India. We've had three speakers. We've had, you are the third speaker in this series. The first person was Professor G. N. Devi, a literary scholar, followed by Adjutant General Sabarwal, and today it's Dr. Kiran Bedi. The broad theme that we've chosen is including inclusion of the excluded, education to the marginalized, and I guess all the activities that you've been spearheading in your various capacities encompass the, uh, will, will be encompassed in this talk. A formal introduction to Dr. Kiran Bedi is there in the invitation cards which have been circulated. Nevertheless, I'll do a brief reading of what has been given here. Kiran Bedi is India's first and highest ranking woman officer who joined the Indian Police Service in 1972 and served for more than three decades practicing innovative and welfare policy. She has worked with the United Nations as the police advisor to the Secretary General in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations and has represented India at the UN and in international forums. Recipients Recipient of the prestigious Maxise Award and several other decorations, Dr. Bedi is an author of several books. Uh, we have a small display outside of the books that she's written, and her book, It's Always Possible, has an entire chapter devoted to education where she's drawn out the experience of IGNO in, in it uh, very uh, in great detail. Dr. Kiran Bedi is the founder of two NGOs, Navjyoti and India Vision Foundation, and has been voted as India's most admired woman and fifth amongst all Indians. Activity. We have a discussant, Professor Sri Krishna Devarao, the director of the School of Law at Indira Gandhi National Open University. Professor Rao has been associated with leading law schools, the National Law School of Bangalore, Nalsar Hyderabad, and Gujarat. His areas of specialization include criminal law, human rights, community legal education, and he has been, shall I say, spearheading many innovative programs in the School of Law here right now. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Seelima Nanda, the Director of the International Division who helped coordinate this entire activity. We have directors of schools, uh, so pro-vice-chancellors, uh, members of the faculty from various schools, members of the administrative staff, and all invited guests present here in our midst. A uh, warm welcome to all of you for this uh, special lecture, as I think it's one of the lectures where we have a full auditorium without much difficulty. <laughs> Thank you, Lakaji. May I now request our Vice Chancellor in his capacity as he's presiding over this evening's proceedings to deliver his remarks. Today's distinguished guest, guest Dr. Kiran Bedi, my colleagues, invitees, and other distinguished guests. On behalf of the university, let me extend Dr. Kiran Bedi a warm welcome. <coughs> we are extremely glad that she has accepted our invitation to deliver the Silver Jubilee Lecture. And uh, we are thankful to her. As a university, we are thankful to her. As ordinary citizens in this country, we are thankful to her in several aspects. One of the initiatives which she has started in Tihar Day, 
that has taken great strides in Indira Gandhi National University. Providing education for several thousands of prisoners. Madam, this year beginning, we have made this education for the prisoners free for the prisoners. Completely free. And I was just showing her an article which was published in the latest open letter of Indira Gandhi National Open University, Breaking the Shackles. And I am a new initiative to offer education for prisoners. I think several such activities she has initiated in the country which has been acclaimed not only in this country all over the world. Her talk, her topic today fits in uh, the inclusive education or inclusive growth program which we all say. In the Gandhi National Open University for the last 25 years has been providing very opportunities for millions of people who cannot afford to come to the conventional university and education system. And in one of the Silver Jubilee Lectures by Director General UNESCO, Ms. Urina Bokova, for, the, for your information, Madam, she was referring Indira Gandhi National Open University as a living embodiment of the inclusive knowledge societies in a globalized world. And UNESCO has also identified IGNO as the largest university in the world. In the UNESCO website, you will see description of IGNO as a representation of the inclusive knowledge societies. I think your contribution and your ideas, all these things definitely will help us to grow, help this institution as well as institutions of this kind to grow uh, in the right perspective. Just, you, just now you mentioned about a new activity which we, which we can probably initiate. You will probably say more about it about something, not just creating an awareness about the uh, problems of domestic violence, maybe starting some programs specifically uh, to curb, uh, which will help curbing of domestic violence. We will be happy to uh, get your guidance, get your coordination for that particular program in this respect. I don't, take, I don't want to take much time. Uh, she's a teacher. She's uh, a social activist, and uh, let us hear her. And let me once again welcome you uh, to this very important activity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Before I invite Dr. Kiran Bedi up to the podium to deliver her address, I'd like to add to what our Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor said about her. She's won all these great awards, she's done so many things, but for people like me and uh, thousands of others like me, she will be clean baby who lifts everything that she does up to the level of social commitment and concern. So we are really honored to have, us, have you with us here, and may I request you to now deliver your lecture. We can bring this down. We can minimize it, and I'll bring it when I need it. Is it come down? Thank you, Mr. Vice-Chancellor. Thank you so much for a wonderful invitation. If I do F5, it will be done. What happened? If I do F5, it will be done. use it. I use the mouse. This is the mouse. OK, that's right. Let's go, let's leave it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to exceedingly privileged to be here today. 
I didn't know that after so many years of imprisoning Ignau, I will come back to your auditorium. It's true that many years ago, when as Inspector General of the Hard Prison, uh, your proposal of Ignau to educate the prisoners was pending for years. And this was the first thing I detected which was pending and uh, was immediately introduced. In fact, it was like a reach out. I needing you, you needing me. And that's how we began the program in 1993. It's fully documented in the book. It's always possible for posterity to know. So therefore, I'm very grateful that what you did for me those many years ago, how willingly you came and offered your educational services so generously, so wholeheartedly. So I think it is an overview gratitude, not in the form of a book, but to be here to personally thank you, Mr. Vice Chancellor. And what I like about it is how you've taken this program all over the world, all over the country, which means it's a revolution. I'm sure it will be the most unique program of its kind in the world because I have not seen such an open, free program for prisoners in more than 35 prisons I've seen around the world. So I think you will be able to claim as one of the most unique program run by an education institution for prisoners anywhere in the world, including liberal democracies. And the manner in which and the number we are attending also would be the unique number in the world because I've seen universities being paid to teach two students at a time. Sometimes, you know, because prisons um, programs are not free as they're free in India. In India, it was community-supported programs, but he, there, since many of the prisons are privatized, it's everything paid for. So therefore, even the prisoners to the universities who come to educate prisoners, they charge their fee. So nothing is free. Overseas, nothing is free. In India, everything is free. <laughs> it's either free or it's subsidized. In the, in the Western, it's either not free or certainly not subsidized. So friends, it's, it's full marks to you. I think it's totally in the Indian spirit. It's totally in the spirit of Indian culture. And the fact that I would say I'm proud of this culture, because this is the way it should be. It has to be. And that's what inclusiveness is really, indeed, in practical terms. So friends, carry on. Yes, I did suggest to Ms. Dr. Pillay two subjects, not one. One is domestic violence as a program. I think it needs to be understood. We have the laws, we have the infrastructure in place, but the knowledge about this law is exceedingly poor. And that is why it's very, it's not well used. But I think knowledge will prevent a problem rather than only detect or correct a problem. So therefore to have this, how can, it could be a training program for NGOs to manage domestic violence. So let this become a training program for counselors and NGOs and voluntary workers to understand the act of domestic violence, what is a protection officer, what is, uh, how, they don't have to go to the police, how does an NGO file and help, I think uh, that would go a long way. Because after doing this Aap Kachari program by the STAR, the STAR and we took, uh, took this program called Aap Ki Kachari, Aap Ke Par. And we did a lot of training programs in the northern belt of India in the cow belt of India, Hindi belt, to reach out to NGOs. And we did in the last six months many programs in Lucknow, in Bhopal, in um, Indore, um, Chandigarh, etc. We did a lot of Jaipur so that uh, we can train NGOs. I think there's a big knowing need. There's a great vacuum, sir. I would urge you to consider it in whatever way I can support it and share my experience, I would love to. The second program I would suggest before I come to my subject, since you've triggered my thought on this, is drug abuse, drug abuse treatment. Because that's another area I'm in it for the last 21 years. And I think it's another program which needs trained counselors. How At the moment, it is a very shocking system. So, uh, patients I treat and I help recover. Those are the patients who start these centers. They're basically entrained. So it's a quackery, it's a quackery treatment. So what they do is they chain the patients. They chain the patients to treat a patient. That's not the way to um, treat a patient. So I would urge that's a second program which is lying uh, needing to be addressed. My both the family counseling centers which I run as a part of my Navjyoti program and the drug abuse treatment program which is crime prevention which I started 21 years ago continues to run which I'm going to show you a slide 
can also be linked with your training program, which where you can send students, we can look at research, we can look at your labs, we can look at the social profiles. So I am open for my institutions to become training material for you and to offer internships to your students who would like to do it. I'm open for that. I'll be very happy if I now we could contribute to this experiential learning. Now on the subject of police. You've given me a wonderful subject, a subject which I've lived my life uh, on that, and how uh, through my uh, love for the service, through the, through the commitment to the service, through the respect to the service, how, how it became a welfare-oriented policing. It became a power to correct, not just power to arrest. It became a welfare policing. It, it was not economics welfare, it was policing welfare. And in fact, my, uh, one of the, the biggest evidence of this concept of welfare policing is my two NGOs, which came along while in service. I do believe that I, it almost happened that I became the first serving police officer anywhere in the world to be opening up NGOs alongside the service. I never knew the rules. I only know that this is the need of the art, and I did it. The second uh, NGO came in as a part of the Raman Maxisse Award, uh, which came in 1994. And awards come with responsibility. Awards sometimes come with substantial corpus money. So you, you have to reinvest into larger welfare. So India Vision Foundation came in 1994 for prison and police reforms, which I'll show you what we did. But the first Navjyoti India Foundation came as a drug, as a, a crime prevention measure to check drug addicts from recycling into criminal. If you look at police reforms ever, remember, while it begins from Indian police it also is the, fifth, the base of the pyramid, which is the constabulary, which we never ever got. It's so critical to understand that if we want to reform policing, if we want good policing, then the fifth bottom of the pyramid has to be addressed, which I think is least. So I thought I would first drive on this point. My second point is, let's know what is our ratio of worst. Nagaland has one cop, one policeman, for 65%. Nagaland. One person for 65 persons. Bihar has one person, one policeman for 1,256 persons. West Bengal has one person for 1,049 persons. Yukutar Pradesh, the land of the statue, is, is, is one person for 1,140 persons and it's trying to create a new police force called the Statue Security Force. <laughs> the number is likely to go up because there's more policemen for statue protection. Sorry, not statue, elephant statue <laughs> And Chhattisgarh, Chhattisgarh, which is a home of nationalites and others, has one policeman for 556. And Delhi, you and I are very privileged. We are one policeman for 250 people in magic. We are the elite and the privileged. Another city which would be would, would be um, wild with us would be Chandigarh. So Chandigarh and Delhi are the privileged policing cities of this country. Nobody else is. And nobody else measures up to the UN standard. The UN standard is at least to have 222 persons per one lakh persons, 222 per one lakh people. So Delhi and Chandigarh are only close to that standard. Rest are far, far away. But even in Delhi, these 250 are not only meant for you and me. Three fourths are away for VIPC. <laughs> well, other states have their VIP securities, but the number of VIPs in Delhi we have I can eat into even that number. But the fact is, Delhi still has a better proportion. So I thought it's important for you as thinking elites to know how many police stations we have in India. We have 30,057 police stations and police force about 7,535. So half, more than half of our policing, police force and police station combined, is in the rural areas. Now, and rural area policing is the weakest link 
eight Indian police. Chhattisgarh, I'll come back to you, the police station, what the state of affairs there is. India has 672 cities. And do you know how many police commissioners we have? Cities, only 34. What comes in the way of professionalizing and having a proper singular police commercial system is our Indian bureaucracy. Indian bureaucracy and the class of the Indian administrative service does not allow, allow more police commissioners to happen in many cities. Police commissioner system is a very similar system of accountability and authority rather than a diluted, diffused system of inspector general and the police commissioner system. I've said it so that I am I'm not here to be politically correct. I'm here to be professional. So I thought I would come straight to the point to tell you what is... Now let me give you what my batchmate and current Home Secretary said, Gopal Pillay, in recently in one of his interviews. He said that 90% of India's internal security problems are there because of, there have been no comprehensive police reforms for the last 60 years. I'm very proud of my batchmate. Gopal Pillay is my batchmate, a friend whom I have great respect for. He is certainly there by his merit. This is a meritorious posting, I do see that. But, and therefore, he's had the courage to say that Indian police is the way it is because there have been no comprehensive reforms for the last 60 years. Who has been uh, blocking these reforms? I will come to that. But that's the way the current Home Secretary said. I've not seen another Home Secretary say this before. He himself said in his interview that the government of India they need to recruit at least 80,000 policemen each year to meet a 600,000 need in the next five to six years. That's why in his interview he said Indian policing, if it does that, would alone be ready and prepared from seven years from now, six years from now. He's candid to admit that it's not going to happen now. It's not going to happen the current. It's going to, if, even if we start doing the right things now, they will happen probably six to seven years from now, even if we do it now, which we don't see happening. Look at police training issues. J Jammu and Kashmir has, I believe, four training schools with no result. And Bihar, till now, does not have a train police training school. Probably it needs it now to train policemen. <laughs> Many of the deputy superintendents of police currently employed, currently employed, Currently employed, newly recruited, young sub-inspectors, masters and graduates probably are certainly not computer trained even now. I urge free police, com free computer training for policemen. I urge you to do that. Free computer training for anybody who's in the police. This is the only way to revolutionize IT training. That would be a singular contribution in police reforms. Encourage to say free any cop coming to our center to learn computers. I am telling you, that would be magic. That would be magic reaching out to 1.7, 2 million coming shortly. If we can do it for prisoners, let's do it for cops. Listen, that's an area to do it. That's an area where directly we will benefit. Let's do it because, I'm saying why, because the, if we depend only on the state governments, my friends, it will not happen during my, your and my lifetime. So if you want to do it faster, then it now must say a special certificate for any cop learning computers online, go to a cyber cafe, at least you can spend some money on cyber cafe, but learns it free. And let, teach them the basics of data entry. Teach them basics of internet access. If you say that, their whole lifestyle will change. So if we can do that, I think it would be a blessing. I think that's probably the reason I'm here. If we can achieve that, my friends, and if Dr. Pillay, you can give this gift to the Indian police service, to two million people, say, it now gives it free to any policeman who wants, let's free, forget about the IPS. <laughs> they get it. They get it all free anyway. They get it free in the National Police Academy. So let, leave out those 4,000 people, but all others, all others don't get it. So their, their facilities are very poor. So I urge you, please have a look at this. And if that can be fulfilled, then every policeman will salute you. <laughs> you will get two million salutes. Two million salutes. Look at some other.
other realities before I come to other issues. I told you about Chhattisgarh. There's only one police station in Andhagar with 11 men. And this is most ridden by violence. Imagine only 11 men. This is happening around the country. That's what rural policing is all about. In UP, the normal tenure of a superintendent of police is only two months. <laughs> in West Bengal, as per Gopal Pillay's interview, he said you needed a party chit to record an FIR. Who said yes? Somebody said yes. Somebody probably has experienced it. <laughs> he said that the, somebody went for an FIR to be lodged and usse thane wale ne poochha, party se chit lai ho. Bole, nahi ho kya hota hai? Bole, pehle CPM party se chit lao, fir ana. To wo gaye, chit laya, aur fir ja ke register hua. Aur jubo chit laya means authorized to register a case. Another situation again given by Gopal Pillay is, it is his interview which I found very amazing. I mean, he's not denied it so far. <laughs> is, he says that in a particular police post when, um, I think the time when Sing, Sing, uh, Lalgar was active, etc., they went to a police post and found the police post vacant. And they said, where are the policemen? They said, they've gone home. Why? Because this is a five-day week. We are CPRM members. Mr. P. Chitambram is on record to say that only nine states have intelligence cells. Only nine states. So much for our intelligence at the ground level. Friends, and another a, a very interesting statement I came across in a West Bengal when there was a Chabi January parade. When the parade was going on, many youth sitting in the audience saying, there goes the Chavannis. <laughs> so what do we do with it? This is where we are. See how long, long way to go. What a long way we have to go. I'm giving this information to you, so do you know the, you know the bottom reality? What happens in Delhi is totally different from what happens in states outside Delhi. You know it equally as I know. But since we are belonging to an elite class of this country, sometimes we do not know the reality. What happens behind us is reality. What happens before us? Because policeman is very sharp. He looks at the face and responds accordingly. Now, where Ignau could come in in a big way, and I'll tell you what I did with the Bureau of Police Research and Development. And that's my experience, and I think Ignau could show the way. Is there's an absolute dearth of policing research. In fact, there's an absence of, of uh, what's actionable research, as we use the word actionable research. Because who is the research? Where is the police research? You may ask me, who researches policing? Who researches policing? They don't get, well, students would like to research policing. Criminologists would do, sociologists would do. They would like to research policing. But who researches? And where is the research finding? And does the research finding come, become public? Does it become a debate? not happened in the last 60 years I've seen. Why? Because the data is not available. There's no right to information on that. You cannot ask the police station to give figures. And number two, the figures are also, as I said, is based on a chit from the party. So therefore, there is a huge dearth and drought. That's where IGNAU comes in. I, I don't know whether IGNAU has a center for police research. And if you do, then we, Coming as an IGNAU student for police research, in particular police research, you will be doing human service to police reforms in this country. Because your research cannot be hidden. It will be public. And it will be policy-making research. And nobody else can do it, I can tell you that. States have no resources to do. And beauty where I was, Bureau of Police Research and Development, had no budget to do research. Five lakhs in a year. Five lakhs is not even the cost of one ambassador car's cost of the year of a year now. Five lakhs in a year. It is such a shame and a disgrace. Nobody had pointed it out, and I had the courage to tell the then powers that be that this is no way to cheat people. 
So stop cheating people. Don't call it Bureau of Police Research and Development because you have no money. You give no money. You have money, but you release no money. And secondly, even if you release money, that project is already four years old. The student is gone. Because the project which a particular person had made, I'm personally aware, and I know I'm on record right now, so I cannot say anything which is not, uh, uh, what, not justiciable. There were some proposals which were in DPRD, I personally saw, an IIT proposal which is more than three and a half years old. That proposal was almost getting cleared four years after. So when we found out whether the research student is still interested, the research student had gone somewhere else. So where will the research be? So basically I'm trying to tell you that there is very inadequate, even if there is some, maybe the Tata Institute of Social Sciences is doing it, or somebody else, I don't know. But that research is not impacting research. It's not actionable research because policing is not researched as a subject in India. Because there is a, a no date, a, no, no access to information. Secondly, there are no resources earmarked. Third, there's no interest because we've dried up the interest. What did I do as DGBPRD was to bring in registrars of universities at no cost to the government and then challenge the registrars saying, why don't you encourage research? Why don't you give these as subjects? Why don't you form teams to research subjects? And so research what? Let's research victim survey in this country. Let's research security index in this country. Let's research the pattern of crime reporting in this country. Let's research the crime patterns emerging in this country. Let's research the state security feeling and perception in this country. Let's research. Look, CNN IBM does a program at the end of the year to do this survey. They do surveys. They don't do research. And it, it makes an impact. And do you know one of the last surveys they did? Aj, Aj Tak did is the uh, uh, trust in policing. And I was shocked to hear 95% did not trust the police. That is a bankruptcy of amazing kind. And we never could, we never got alarmed by that. That we 95% don't trust the policing. What is this department doing? It, nobody shook. Nobody was angry. It just went on and on. And a recent survey, another one, is 70% trust judiciary, which is brilliant for me. I'm very happy to realize 70% still trust the judiciary, but 95% don't trust policing. Friends, this is an area. It now can again lead this area. If you don't do it, you'll be one like many others who didn't do it. You could do it. You could offer special scholarships for this. I don't know. This needs a very strong surge because if you're going to depend only on one Iklota BPRMB in India, then there is no research. So that means there is no research. How did American policing change? American policing changed for two fa factors, business plus media. American policing changed only by two factors. Business got up and said enough is enough. We can't have this lawlessness because economy is so much, so much security related. So they pumped in money for research. They pumped in money for research and a lot of research. Universities, they gave grants to university. Universities then uh, uh, allowed scholarships. A huge amount of research on policing happened, all on the table. Media played it up and research start and change happened. Friends, this is a secret of many years ago how American policing changed. It's the business houses which sponsored re police research, gave the money to the American universities, which are chairs by now, and research happened. And it's constantly research and every bit is exposed. So friends, what do we do? It's we need new systems of reporting. What are the new systems could be? Who will tell as a policy? So I, I, how do we use technology? We need to research this. What could be the new systems of reporting? Because we know systems are not correct. No victim service. We need to do some victim service. We don't have a single victim, national victim survey till now. Not a single national victim survey. So it said, what is not measured never gets done. And I said, independent crime service. No systems of past learnings. I was amazed to see the statement of Mr. Jyoti Basu the other day. When he said, we will learn lessons from this, uh, this massacre which happened recently, few, five days ago in, in Sadli, what is the name? Somewhere in, in West Bengal, where they've suspended an uh, inspector general who covered his face and said that that site was not safe at all for policemen to be killed. As 25 to 30 men have been killed. Shigla? 
S H I N. Yes. Sinda, right? See that? How many of you know? No, how many of you know? How many of you keep your track? Imagine so many one policeman getting killed in the United States. You have Obama making a statement. One policeman. And you have 30 of plus policemen die. We are all so used to it now. We are all used to. Why? Who is dying here is the 90% people. The poor. It is the poor who are dying. Not the rich. So let the poor die. Because we have an abundance of poor people, right? So my friends, we don't have a system of past learnings. And Mr. Basu said on the television, and it again made my blood boil, because he said, we will uh, examine this massacre and find out what went wrong. And I wanted to tell him, what has gone wrong? You have enough evidence of you. Why don't you look at that? But it's just one more statement given. Who is going to look? Because we don't have an institutionalized system of past learnings at all. There's no institution system. And there's no research on past learnings. No researcher has gone into big, all right, let's pick up this as a case and say, which were the earlier um, uh, five, six such massacres and what were the lessons learned from these committees? Let's put it on the website.